حدش أسدي الأرض بتحطم شلدي كيف بتبيعني للعومة الدود بين حدش أسدي الأرض بتحطم شلدي كيف خسرتك للعومة الدود بين حدش أسدي الأرض بتحطم شلدي كيف بتبيعني جسدي والارض بتحطم جلدي كيف خسرتك لرقومة Good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone uh, Welcome to this event uh, entitled From Non-Discrimination to Gender Equal Peace, uh, which will look at the synergies between the Women, Peace and Security Agenda and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So a critical topic, given how essential human rights and women's human rights in particular are to inclusive peace and vice versa. Before we begin, I just wanted to uh, remind you all or let you all know that we have interpretation uh, for this event available in French, Spanish, Arabic and Ukrainian. Uh, so if you'd like to uh, use any of those channels, just click on the interpretation button and select. Uh, we also have our uh, colleagues uh, doing the interpretation to the uh, American Sign Language, uh, who you can see uh, on the screen. So with this, it is my pleasure to hand over first to uh, Mr. John Spaskier, the Head of Global Affairs at the Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the United Nations in Geneva. The Permanent Mission is uh, co-organizing this event with the Global Network of Women Peace Builders, and Switzerland has been a long-term partner in this endeavor to strengthen the synergies between um, Women, Peace and Security and CEDA. So John, it is a pleasure to have you here with us, and the mic is yours. Thank you so much, Agnieszka, and, and thank you so much, colleagues, uh, and a warm welcome to, to all participants to this, uh, to this panel discussion. Um, and we really look forward also, I look forward personally to be, to be opening the, 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 the scene and the, the floor here after having covered uh, women, peace and security issues in, in New York in the last four years. Um, and and it's, it's a particular and personal pleasure to open a conversation between New York and Geneva that aims at, at better connecting the expertise of both sides of the ocean and also uh, the expertise from, from the field as we will hear from, from our distinguished panelists on such a, an important issue. Uh, of course, uh, the WPS agenda and human rights are, are two crucial, crucial foreign policy priorities for, for Switzerland as we are also, uh, I mean, for themselves, for, for what they aim at achieving, but also uh, as we see them as intimately uh, related and, and, and interconnected and, and mutually reinforcing. Um, in this framework, uh, we feel that the action of the, of the global network of women peace builders uh, is at the forefront of, of these linkages and, and with the support of, of Switzerland, among, among others, we are we are really happy to see it is it is bearing important results as at uh, at all levels. As you said, Agnieszka, Switzerland collaboration with uh, GNWP dates back to uh, 2012, when we started to raise awareness on the very complementarity between uh, CEDO and the Security Council resolutions on uh, WPS. Um, and ever since, we've had the fruitful partnerships uh, in strength, strengthening uh, these synergies. Uh, and in strengthening the inclusion of CEDO uh, committee recommendations uh, in the reporting uh, on WPS obligations and, and commitments. Um, some, some examples, just very briefly, of, of what our cooperation, uh, uh, what fruits our cooperation has, has borne over, over the years. Of course, uh, there was this important uh, ARIA formula meeting in December 2016. Uh, co-organized I mean, um, or led by uh, Uruguay, who was then member of uh, the Security Council on the synergies between Security Council resolutions and women, peace and security, uh, on women, peace and security and CEDO. And I believe it was the first time a treaty body addressed uh, the Security Council, uh, which was, of course, uh, an important uh, door opener for, for more collaboration on, on that front. 
In July 2018, um, there was also um, in the CEDA Committee and the SRC on Sexual Violence in Conflict signed a cooperation framework with the aim of strengthening the synergies between CEDO and uh, the WPS architecture. Uh, and I believe here it's also a first, uh, the first cooperation agreement between the Security Council mandated body and the human rights mechanism. So, so really a, a very tangible success there as well. And also obviously uh, on the ground, um, uh, GNWP has, has, uh, has, has been, uh, GNWP has been facilitating country level trainings on the use of CEDAW General Recommendation 30. Uh, and as we will hear, for instance, in Palestine and, and in Ukraine, um, and those trainings on the ground will uh, include both government and civil societies also with the aim of, of strengthening the dialogue between them uh, and how to uh, use the different instruments in synergy. And I, I am really looking forward to hearing more about the dynamics and lessons learned uh, of these processes by, by our panelists from, from those, those countries and, and regions. Uh, looking ahead and, and, and to conclude, uh, just let me uh, seize this opportunity to share with you a few milestones that uh, will pave the way of Switzerland's engagement in pushing for better implementation of the WPS agenda in those coming months and, and years. First, uh, after being one of the first countries to, to have uh, adopted a, a national action plan back, back then, Switzerland is currently implementing its fourth, uh, its fourth NAP, uh, as always in close collaboration with civil society organizations. So it's gonna, it's, it's going, it will continue to be a priority uh, on, on a daily basis uh, for us. Second, we prepare to assume the co-chairmanship of the WPS Focal Point Network together with South Africa starting in January. Uh, it is a great honor and responsibility to take on this, 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 uh, this, uh, this responsibility, but, uh, but we hope especially to engage with many of you throughout the year in Geneva, in New York, on the ground, uh, including uh, with, a, with a few dedicated events, uh, including here in, in, in Geneva. Uh, third, Switzerland recently accessed to the Global Compact on Women, Business, Security and Humanitarian Action. Uh, in the framework of the general generation equality forum uh, which we see as a way to bolster uh, the important work of civil society on, on these issues and fourth and certainly not least uh, as you may know uh, we are also um, uh, 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 preparing and, and presenting our bid for a, a non-permanent seat in the security council in 23 24 which would be uh, switzerland's first time uh, on the council and if elected, of course, uh, WPS will remain an essential agenda on the, on the Council's uh, uh, agenda, um, as we must step up implementation to, 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 to build a more comprehensive, inclusive and, and sustain, sustainable peace throughout the Security Council agenda. And this will remain, of course, a key uh, in, in uh, one and a half, over, uh, over a year that that's left until we would eventually uh, join the council. So uh, with, without further ado, uh, let's hear more about uh, the, the setup of the event from, from you, Mavic, and, and especially also from, from the panelists on the, the synergies concretely uh, between CEDO committee and the WPS agenda and how we can drive further progress uh, on that front uh, in the, all together and with joint efforts between Geneva, New York and, and on the ground. Thank you so much, and we wish you a very insightful panel discussion. Thank you so much, Jonas, for, for uh, highlighting those important achievements of the past, but also opportunities uh, looking into the future. Congratulations to Switzerland on your fourth uh, national action plan. And uh, uh, of course, uh, congratulations and thank you for uh, joining the compact. We look forward to working with you within that framework, uh, as well as uh, within the frameworks of the uh, Women's and Security Focal Point uh, Networks and, and of course, uh, um, keeping our, our fingers crossed and, and wishing you all the best with the UN Security Council uh, bid. Uh, and thank you in particular for stressing the importance of establishing and strengthening those links between the, the New York world and the Geneva world between human rights and peace and security agendas, which cannot exist without each other. Uh, it's now my honor and pleasure to uh, hand the floor over to uh, Ms. Mavic Cabrera Baleza, the Chief Executive Officer of the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. Uh, Mavic, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? 
Can you yes, hear me? We can, yes, we can hear you well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's uh, a bit um, yeah, noisy here. I just wanted to uh, say um, greetings to everyone who has uh, taken the, yeah, the time out of their busy schedule to join us today and uh, to uh, uh, the CEDAW committee for the uh, collaboration through the years, even before the adoption of the General Recommendation 30 uh, on women in conflict prevention in conflict and post-conflict situations. And of course, to Switzerland for their um, continuing and very, very strong support to this work even before it's, you know, even during the inception phase, and of course, all of our partners, I can see our partners from different countries. And I'm sorry if I'm not able to mention everyone. I'm using a cell phone, so it's my, my view is limited. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to emphasize the different uh, catalytic um, initiatives that uh, John has already highlighted. And I recall during the ARIA formula, I, you know, we spent one year one year to, <laughs> to um, get the green light from the Security Council members because it was a very, I would say, um, yeah, a, a revolutionary idea at that time. And um, for those of you who are following uh, and engaging with the UN um, for, for many years like us, uh, there's a tendency to work in silos or you know the the work be limited strictly to the preference when even when clearly the issues are, are very much related you see the work of the security council as stated in the um the resolution 1325 1820 and and all of the eight other supporting resolutions is about women's uh, participation in decision making uh, in political and peace processes. And it's about preventing conflict and preventing sexual, uh, sexual violence and other forms of sexual violence. And this is clearly the, the, the mandate too of the, um, of, um, of the uh, Office of the Special Representative uh, on sexual violence in conflict. And yet, when we were presenting the idea to the Security Council members and they, you know, that work, you know, how important it is to work with uh, the CEDAW committee, and they were saying, oh, I think uh, that's overste overstepping their boundaries for the committees. Um, their, their mandate is clear on women's rights. But, you know, we were saying the Women, Peace and Security resolutions are about women's rights. But you know, it, it's it's about pushing the envelope and having supportive member states with us, like Switzerland, like Uruguay, and of course the unflinching um, um, advocacy of civil society that you make things happen. You make things happen. Uh, it, it's you know work for the long haul, and I th yeah the the number, the increasing number of member states reporting to the CEDAW committee when therefore there were none um, reporting on, on, on the implementation of the women, peace and security agenda in their respective country are an evidence of, of, um, of how far we've come in this advocacy, because as we know, uh, uh, monitoring and the use of indicators are our guideposts in, in not only in, um, uh, celebrating our achievements, but, of, but, more importantly, or equally important, or more importantly, in looking at the gaps, what else do we need to do? And as we know, there's always more work that needs to be done than we realize until there's exact monitoring and reporting. And for that, um, I think we should all, you know, those who are involved in this process, uh, we should all uh, congratulate ourselves at the same time, be aware of uh, the work that still needs to be done. Uh, I'll end here and uh, just to emphasize again uh, how much uh, we need to uh, pat ourselves on the back uh, for the achievements, but at the same time take stock of um, that there are more, there's still a long list of to do's in, in this advocacy until we see this effectively implemented in, in all countries of the world. 
So thank you again for um, the partnership. Thank you for this opportun another opportunity to work with all of you. And greetings from here in Beirut. Thank you so much, Mavic, for those inspiring words for highlighting the work that has already been done, uh, the, the effort and persistence and innovation that bridging those gaps and, and forging those synergies uh, really requires, even if they may seem obvious uh, to some of us, they may seem obvious to us now, but it's really the determination and commitment that have brought us to this point. And importantly, there still remains uh, some work to be done. Uh, in this regard, uh, before I hand over the um, microphone to our uh, panelists, who who are whom we all want to want to hear today, I wanted to highlight uh, both Jonas and Mavic have spoken of the work uh, GNWP with support and in collaboration with Switzerland have done to advance those synergies uh, over the years, and of course in partnership and collaboration with our partners around the world. Some of them are here today, uh, such as the Democracy Development uh, Center and, and El Alamak, as well as uh, Rima Nazal from the General Union of Palestinian uh, Women. Uh, but um, one of the aspects of the work that we have done was a policy brief that was produced in back in 2018. I will share the link uh, to the, to the um, policy brief, brief in the chat. It was at the time an extremely important research because it has helped us she, see the trends, see where he, we have come to. Two years after that ARIA formula um, uh, convened by uh, Uruguay, but a, a result of a long-standing advocacy, <clears throat> and uh, uh, a number of years also after the adoption of the General Recommendation 30. And I just wanted to highlight two uh, aspects, two findings, which I think our panelists will speak to. So that's why I want us to have them in mind as, uh, as, a, as, a, as a sort of background. Uh, the first one was that while there was and there continues to be, and we are actually updating this data uh, right now, an increasing trend, an increasing number of countries that use the CEDO report, uh, the CEDO state party reports as a tool to report on women, peace and security. So as a monitoring and reporting tool for their women, peace and security commitments. While there was an increase in that number, uh, there was still sometimes a lack of depth so the mentions of uh, 1325 would be uh, very superficial, the, often, sometimes in some of the reports. Uh, and uh, uh, when there was further analysis, it often focused only, let's say, on women in the military or conversely, only on women in their roles as victims. So there wasn't a deeper analysis of the impact of conflict across all spheres of women's life and importantly, of women's um, contributions to peace and peace building. And the CEDAW committee, you know, has played a really important role in bringing that to the fore in the constructive dialogue, which our dear uh, panelist, um, Bandana Rana, who is a member of the CEDAW committee, will speak to, to more uh, in bringing out uh, this complexity of really the linkages between women, peace and security and CEDAW, uh, and CEDAW uh, obligations. So taking it beyond that, that uh, that more superficial level of, of just mentioning the resolution or mentioning the national action plan. And the second finding that I wanted to highlight was really the importance that is attached to the uh, civil society shadow reports by the CEDAW committee and the really impact that the civil society uh, shadow reports can have in highlighting the, the, the again, the complex and the nuanced uh, relation or interlinkages between women's human rights and the CEDAW commitments and the peace and security situation and the women peace and security commitments in a country. Uh, so um, building on those findings, as Jonas also mentioned, we have worked in six countries now working with our civil society partners to support both the governments to include a more, more robust more in-depth analysis of women, peace and security in their state party reports and with our uh, civil society partners uh, to, to support the, 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 the drafting of shadow uh, reports that, that reflect the important considerations in the specific can, country context. But 
our panelists are much better placed to talk to you about that than myself. Uh, so with that, I will now open our panel discussion on progress and gaps in building synergies between CEDA and the World Peace and Security Agenda. While I do that, I just want to uh, remind you that uh, to, to please introduce yourself in the chat. The chat is open. I can see we have people from South Africa, Guyana, uh, Northern Ireland, Poland, the UK, uh, Lebanon, uh, all over the world joining. Please add your, uh, your introduction, uh, introduce yourself in the uh, chat box, and please don't hesitate to post your questions for our panelists as they speak. You can do it either in the chat or in the dedicated Q&A box. We might open the floor for, for some of you to take the microphone and make an intervention or ask a question, but please don't wait for, for that moment because um, uh, we might not have time to give uh, space to, to everyone and, and uh, we really want to make sure we our panelists are able to answer all questions. So please go ahead and put your questions as they emerged in the chat or in the Q&A section. So now turning to our distinguished panel, uh, I already mentioned we have three uh, really excellent speakers, Ms. Bandana Rana, uh, who is the mem a member of the CEDA uh, committee and also happens to be, of which we are very proud, uh, the chair of the board of the Global Network of World Peace Builders. And we are very happy and, 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 and honored to have her here with us today to share her uh, experience. Ms. Bananarana heads the task force on the CEDA committee uh, working on the women, peace and security uh, issues. Um, so Banana, thank you for being with us. I will uh, turn to you with a, with a question on from the CEDA committee uh, perspective, you know, I, I talked about the interactive dialogue with the state parties and 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 the, the impact that the CEDA committee really had through that. What have been your observations in terms of how the integration of women, peace and security into the state party reports into the, the dialogue has, has evolved, has changed over the years? And also, um, Jonas mentioned earlier the cooperation framework that was signed between the CEDA committee and the office of the special representative of the Secretary General for sexual violence and conflict. Uh, so I wonder, again, from your perspective, being on the CEDA committee, uh, how has this framework been used uh, uh, in practice and what have been some good aspects, some successes, and perhaps some, uh, some remaining gaps or, or aspects that could be improved. Uh, thank you again for being with us and the floor is yours, Bandana. Thank you, thank you, Agneska, and greetings from Nepal to everyone. Uh, I can't ex tell you how happy I am uh, as chair of the GNWP board uh, and, um, and a peace practitioner, uh, you know, and, and would also like to thank GNWP for its wonderful work and a very crucial and essential work in building the synergy between the um, CEDA committee and the WPS agenda. Uh, so this is one of the uh, panel discussion that, uh, that uh, GNWP is holding and I'm really proud of it. It's very necessary and important. I want to thank Jonas also for all the milestones that he mentioned. And I just wanted to say Jonas, uh, congratulations on of course your fourth national action plan. And I was honored to be there during the launch of your fourth national action plan as um, one of the speakers sharing my perspectives as a CEDAW committee member, but also uh, as, as from Nepal, a country, I come from a country emerging from conflict and have been a, a very active civil society peace practitioner working with conflict affected, um, uh, directly with conflict affected women and girls. And uh, then understanding the importance of the WPS resolution and advocating for developing the National Action Plan. In fact, being one of the key drafter of the National Action Plan uh, in Nepal in 2010 and 2011. And then I'm, I'm, I'm uh, sharing this uh, before my affiliation with CEDAW, you know, uh, as a, as a uh, committee member. And then uh, the frustration that the Security Council does not have a reporting mechanism where countries can be made accountable for uh, its effective implementation on the WPS agenda. So, you know, going through that journey and then advocating, of course, with GNWP and other partners for this general recommendation 30, even before I was a committee member, and then bringing um, uh, this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, 
the, the state party's responsibility, accountability uh, through the reporting mechanism, uh, the CEDAW legal framework uh, through the GR30. So I now that I'm in the CEDAW committee and uh, you know, the SRSG now on sexual violence, Pramila Patin was uh, previously a member of the CEDAW committee. And uh, she was the chair of the task force on GR30 when I entered the committee in 2017. But early 2017, she got this appointment and she left the committee. And I'm here now uh, replacing her, substituting her as the chair of the task force of the CEDAW committee on GR30, which is a difficult task because she's been a very uh, you know, effective leader in that area as well. Uh, so, you know, so I, I feel so close to, to be able to, little did I imagine that, I, that when I advocated for the GR30, uh, that I would be a, a member in the CEDAW committee, in fact, heading the task force for the GR30 and engaging directly in its application. And I can't imagine how important and what a difference it has made. You know, I'm, I'm directly speaking from my perspective as a CEDAW committee member leading this task force. It, it is no longer called a task force. I'll come to that later, but, uh, and, and, being able to see visibly, you know, uh, the, the strengthening of state accountability on WPS agenda through this mechanism has been very, very, you know, rewarding, I must say. You know, CEDAW, uh, in my, in my, uh, since 2017, I've been in the CEDAW, this is my second mandate in the CEDAW committee. I, I have seen and uh, how uh, we have given importance to the WPS agenda. There are sometimes confusions. Members do ask, task force members of a particular state party ask, do we cover the WPS agenda under Article 3 or 1 and 2 or Article 5, sometimes trafficking Article 6, participation or even employment, you know. But more and more gradually now, uh, we are addressing the committee itself is addressing or questioning state parties on the WPS agenda right at the beginning of the article, uh, beginning of the dialogue under Article One and Two. You know, so it shows how much importance. In fact, I can give you the recent example of uh, the constructive dialogue we had with Yemen and South Sudan just recently. We've uh, you know completed a ATF session, and uh, that's because that particularly with countries emerging from conflict or in conflict, like these two countries. So we set the agenda, set the context itself right at the beginning about the importance and the recognition of WPS as one of the key uh, concerns when addressing the holistic rights of women. So that is the importance that we uh, give to the WPS agenda within the CEDAW committee. And with the adoption of the GR30, how we draw the attention is the committee draws the attention of state parties to UNSCR 1325 on WPS and the subsequent resolutions and calls for the full implementation of the resolution in accordance with the provisions of the conventions of GR 30 on women in conflict prevention, conflict and post-conflict situations. The committee recalls the importance of SDG goal 16. This is also what we highlight and calls on state parties to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development provide access to justice for all and build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels with women in the center of all decisions and programming. And the CEDAW committee has consistently highlighted the applicability of CEDAW in conflict and called for reporting on the status of women in conflict situation and on women's participation in decision-making on security and in transition to peace. As a result, as Agneska also mentioned, the depth and detail of the recommendations has increased over time and the reporting from the state parties has also increased. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, we, we used to have an intern and I must mention this, you know, we have an important state party here. I look at Switzerland as one of the leaders in the WPS agenda from where small countries um, uh, and developing countries, countries in conflict learn, you know, in terms of implementation of the WPS agenda. Within the CEDAW committee, one of the biggest crunch we face, whether we and particularly I do say that WP in, in, in implementing the GR30 or the WPS agenda is, as I said earlier, uh, the task force has now been converted into a focal point. So I'm now the focal point of WPS, which means you do not have secretariat assistance, which means you do not meet consistently as you did 
when you are a full-fledged task force, uh, you do not have a regular analysis procedure, a documentation procedure, uh, so which, which does have its gaps and weaknesses because you don't have uh, the platform to share deliberations, uh, perceptions, and guide each uh, committee members as to how WPS agenda can be addressed uh, throughout the 16 articles. You know, so that is what I miss. But when we had an intern, right at two, I think 2017 and 2018, I do recall there used to be a gist of what we compiled, what were the kind of questions asked, how did the state party report? And uh, there was an observation that uh, uh, from the time before the GR30 and after GR30, uh, there was an increase of state parties reporting on WPS agenda with a separate title as Women, Peace and Security in its report itself, almost 40% of state parties that reported in 2017 and 2018, there was an increase, almost 40% of state parties had reported with a separate specific title on Women, Peace and Security agenda. I think that itself is a huge uh, achievement. And however, we do not have this regular documentation process now, as I said, because we do not have any uh, human resources to do so. So I think uh, one of the help that civil societies like GNWP can do is also have, if, if possible, provide a consistent, regular uh, intern who can document, assess, uh, um, you know, and, and um, uh, follow the, the procedures of the state parties, which would actually help the committee itself in its deliberations as well. So this is something that I show as um, uh, one of the gap that we have. But but of course, all this has uh, increased recognition among, among state parties that women's right to equality is fundamental to the achievement of the WPS agenda. That recognition is increasing more and more from among state parties, as we can see uh, from their reports, uh, from the concluding observations and the follow-up reports as well. Uh, the, the committee, uh, if you have followed, poses detailed questions, you know, um, particularly the National Action Plan has been one of the key pillar in terms of the implementation of 1325, and the questions are uh, revolved around it, its development, the budgetary allocations, the procedures and process about how a National Action Plan is developed, particularly uh, collaborative approach, uh, uh, specifically with civil society partners. Uh, you know, this is one of the key agenda that we covered a lot. As Agneskia mentioned earlier, uh, I do recall also that, uh, uh, you know, uh, women's, uh, within the WPS agenda, women are reported more as passive victims than active agents of change. There is very little reporting on women in decision-making positions in the WPS agenda or in negotiations or in mediations. So these are things that we need to look into as well. Uh, and see how we can improve this. And um, the guidebook that UN Women had brought out on GR30 is an excellent guidebook, excellent guidance. But again, as I said, I think we lack the platform and the consistency uh, in, 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 in terms of sharing uh, immediately after a dialogue or before a dialogue on how its uh, entirety uh, applicability could be used in the deliberation. Um, um, the other area that uh, I say, which is an improvement, is the earlier shadow reports never contained anything on WPS agenda, you know, except to give a historical perspective of the country, but not as a specific area women in uh, conflict was never addressed. But now more and more civil society reports uh, contain uh, tremendous uh, information. Um, which, which helps the committee a lot in its deliberations, in its preparation of list of issues, um, and, in, and in its follow-up reports as well. So I think uh, that's another area that is extremely helpful. Uh, I know I'm, uh, uh, I, have a, I don't have much time, but I just wanted to, before I stop, I just wanted to mention the joint framework that has been uh, signed with the special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence, uh, our former CEDAW committee colleague, Pramila Paten, in 2018. And this has been significant in terms of enabling mutual implementation of legal and normative frameworks for the enhanced protection of women's rights in conflict, particularly related to sexual violence. Uh, we do share resources, we share information, we do have frequent consultations. It's not regular, but we do have, as and when needed, frequent consultations. Uh, and I have seen that CEDAW committee's evidence has been used by the SRA, SRSG to inform her country analysis and recommendations 
and the SRSG in her 2020 report also relied on the CEDAW committee's country specific activities and concluding observations to inform her analysis of conflict related sexual violence in Cambodia and Myanmar. When CEDAW committee sought an exceptional report with Myanmar, we uh, derived a lot of information from the, um, the secretary, the, the SRSG's reports, and we were in close consultation with her uh, with the information which she used later as well. Recently, in our 80th session, uh, the CEDAW committee has decided uh, to seek an exceptional report with Afghanistan, and uh, we are in constant touch with the SRHG on um, its legal implications, on the approach that we should be taking. Um, you know, so these are areas, I think this is a very, uh, you know, in terms of our agenda to build synergy, the connection between New York, uh, the WPS agenda and Geneva, I think uh, the joint framework is one of the significant landmark um, cooperation that we have signed, which we need to strengthen further and continue. Um, and, and I'm sure it will enhance, uh, mutually enhance our work in our implementation of our agenda. So I'll stop here now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bandana, for those important points for highlighting both the evolution, the transformation, and how the Women, Peace, and Security has been mentioned in both the State Party and the Shadow Reports uh, for highlighting some of the remaining challenges, right, and in particular the capacity, right, that of the of the task force that is now no longer the task force and the the, the importance of, of, of maintaining that work and of having that uh, that body there, but also for, for your reflection on the joint framework and um, and the information exchange. I mean, the information exchange is the very you know key first first uh, point to ensuring better collaboration and and it was the the, the, the key uh, intent of the framework. So it is great to to hear how it played out in practice, including in Cambodia and, and Myanmar, as you as you mentioned. So thank you so much again for for sharing this. And I'm sure we'll come back to you with questions. I can already see there are some questions in our question and answer box. So we'll we'll get uh, get to them in our question and answer session. Uh, but for now, it is my pleasure to now uh, turn to Miss uh, Ella Lamach. Uh, the head of the Democracy Development um, Center, a GNWP's member and, 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 and long-term partner uh, in Ukraine and, and one of the leading organizations on the implementation of women, peace and security in Ukraine at the both national and, and local uh, level. And Ella, we have worked together, GNWP and uh, DDC uh, to uh, advance this issue, this topic of the synergies between women, peace and security and CEDAW. We've conducted a number of trainings with civil society, with, with um, government officials on the synergies and, and uh, trainings, but also reflection, strategizing spaces on how to best include it. Um, we were really pleased to see, and I, I look forward to hearing your thoughts as well, that uh, Women, Peace and Security was quite substantively integrated into the latest state party report of Ukraine uh, to CEDAW. Uh, so it was great to see this robust and in-depth analysis in the state party report. Uh, I wanted to ask you what you, what you thought were the factors that, that, that contributed, enabled such a positive outcome, perhaps any advice that you would have to share with, with others, the civil society in other countries and governments as they prepare their own uh, reports. Uh, and also because DDC is involved, is one of the uh, civil society organizations now working on a shadow report highlighting uh, that issue. Uh, any reflections or thoughts you might have around, around that from DDC's experience? Uh, the, the floor is yours, Ella. And as you know, we have interpretation from Ukraine and I think you will speak in English, but if you'd like to, to change, go ahead as well. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, can you hear me? And also thank you very much, Bandana, that you um, have a good, uh, nice speech. And I remember how we worked with our government and uh, spoke with them about, please remember that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is important part of our report, government report, uh, NGOs report. Also, I want to, uh, I, I see an uh, interp one interpreter wrote that, please speak more slowly. I will speak more slowly and 
First of all, I would like to say thank you very much for invitation and I'm glad to be here with you today. My speech consists of two parts. The first issue I want to raise is whether we all know that the gender policy is supported by various international commitments and that they support each other. This is a qual quality important for both the authorities and the civil society. At a recent workshop for the Central Body of Executive Power and Civil Society Organization on synergy between CEDAW uh, and the Women, Peace and Security Agenda, a representative of UN Women's Country Office in Ukraine asked the participants if anyone uses the CEDAW general recommendation, namely 30 and 36, in their work in preparing plans in and in reporting. Of almost 40 participants, only three raised their hands. Actually, we thank the Global Network of Women Peace, uh, Peace Builders for providing us with the cutting edge topics, approach, and materials for workshops. We have been disseminating them in Ukraine at different levels from the national to the local levels. On such methods, is to outline synergy between different international documents that promote women's rights like CEDO and Women, Peace and Security Agenda. We have been using the synergy table in training for both national and local authorities and NGOs. The responses from different participants were the same, only after getting acquainted with this method did they understand that all international commitments are interconnected and complement each other, and that it is not necessary to create many different documents and activities on local levels or national levels. The problem is that unfortunately in Ukraine, all these diverse activities are not funded. Each structure hopes that international donors will support these measures. A lot of act, uh, local action plans plan don't have um, money. This is a big problem for Ukraine. Many action plans without money, uh, without money and without human resource. In addition, we teach the authorities and NGOs to include certain 25 in their strategy and action plans to support youth, education, sports, health, and other, uh, other areas so that they see that this is not something separate and that both 1325 and CEDO have to be seen as a cross-cutting element of any community development policy. It's uh, actually, it's important for me, it's understand to 1325 of Women, Peace and Security Agenda is cross-cutting topic in our report for CEDO Committee too. The second part of my speech concerns the reporting process to the CEDO Committee. Our organization has been involved in the preparation of alternative reports to the committee for more than 15 years. And we are well aware that NGOs also need to be taught to use the committee's generals and country specific recommendation to take them into account when preparing, preparing reports. NGO also need appropriate training to understand what the synergy between international commitments and how they are reflected at the national level. It is crucial that NGO consult the committee members of experts who understand the preparation of reports. The committee members are very open and supportive and not all NGO know about this. They also have to be aware of the changes in the report requirements. Based on our experience in the process of collective work on the report, many NGO drop out from the coalition due to different reasons. Some fail to find statistics 
or to complete their part of the task. Some lose interest, some cannot find funding, some demand honoraria of the work. To give you an example, recently Russia submitted its country report to CEDA committee and it, it did not cover Crimea and the occupied territory of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast. Several Ukraine's women's angel and gender experts began developing a special report on the status of women in these territories. And in the process, only the, our organization and gender expert Maria Rudenka were left. So we submitted this report uh, by otherwise. otherwise. To conclude all our recommendation to NGO was as follows. First of all, they have to learn about the international commitments and how they work in synergy. They have to understand how these documents relate to the issues that NGOs are working with the national and local level. This helps NGOs apply this tool successfully in the work. Secondly, they have to learn about the reporting process as a tool of adv advocacy and for monitoring the actual results, changes and trend in the country. They can collect both quantitative and qualitative indicators to, more, to better reflect the current situation and identify the areas that require more attendant attention or and efforts. Actually, it's important for me to cooperate with CEDA uh, committee members. Also, uh, we are working with UN uh, Women Office in Ukraine in the help us to understand how uh, procedure is working, how uh, member committee is working. Actually, don't worry about uh, to connect with uh, members committee. They are open and uh, help you. It's uh, actually, it's important for me to understand when I connect with uh, uh, CEDO committee members that my work is important for them. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you so much, Ella, for sharing this experience in particular for highlighting the importance of uh, first the creation of awareness, the training for civil society, but also for government officials, creating that first spark of realizing there is a link there, right? The, the, they're not completely different, uh, uh, different obligations. They're not completely different worlds. They're closely related legal documents and, and, and legal obligations that need to be uh, implemented holistically and uh, reported on holistically as well. And thank you also for highlighting the role of civil society and providing those shadow reports, providing that critical perspective, especially when it might be missing uh, from the uh, state party report. But even if the state party report already includes good information, the civil society perspective is always critical, is always, um, it's always useful and, and always enriching, as, as we've heard from uh, Bandana as well. Uh, so this is an excellent uh, uh, point, I, I think, to, to turn to our third panelist um, with uh, Ms. Rima Nazal, who's a representative from the General Union of Palestinian Women in Palestine. And Rima was one of our participants when back in 2018, together with GNWP partner Wiam. Uh, we held a training on women's insecurity in CEDA uh, in Amman, Jordan, but with women's civil society and members of the Palestinian government, Palestinian Authority, uh, coming from uh, both West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and so, Rima, you were there with us, but uh, you were all, uh, also amongst the women. The General Union of Palestinian Women submitted a shadow report, actually, to CEDA, um, looking in particular or specifically at the uh, uh, resolution 1325 and women peace and security commitments within within the seat of frameworks uh, so i wanted so i wanted to turn to you with a question uh regarding the 
uh, your experience of producing the, uh, the shadow report. Uh, you called for more meaningful inclusion of women in the ongoing peace negotiations, something that as Bandana said, is often not present in those CEDA uh, reports and, 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 and uh, especially the state party reports. Uh, so I wanted to ask, why was it important for you to have women, peace and security, to have that peace lens in the shadow report and whether you've seen any impact of the report, uh, any any results uh, <clears throat> from it, uh, and and uh, what do you think is needed to see even more impact from reports like that one? So Rima, thank you once again so much for for being here with us today, and the floor is yours. And to our uh, audience, to our listeners, uh, Rima will speak in Arabic. So if you need interpretation, please make sure that you activate it at the bottom of your screen now. And don't forget to put your questions to our panelists in the chat box uh, or the Q&A box as they speak. Rima, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, Rima, uh, you are muted, yes. Shukran uh, Sorry. Shukran kthir ala ishraki fi hadhi al-warsha. Wa shukur mawsool li jami' al-qaimiyin ala tanzimaha. Lanaha warsha muhimma lana fi Filistin. وتحديدا في موضوع التآزر والربط ما بين القرار 1325 وما بين اتفاقية سيداو لأننا الآن يعني منذ تقريبا عامين نربط بين هذه المسألتين ولحد الآن أعتقد أنه السنة على الطريق لم يقتنعوا الجميع في, في هذا الربط لأنهم يعتبروا بأن القرار 1325 يندرج في إطار القرارات التي وضعت لفلسطين وهي قرارات لا تطبق وتحديدا القرارات السياسية وأن القرار 1325 لا ينطبق إلا, إلا إذا انطبق قرارات مجلس الأمن الخاصة بالقضية الفلسطينية تجربتنا مع تقرير, مع تقرير الظل وأنا كنت واحدة من الذين أعدوا التقرير بالمناسبة أنا أيضا المنسقة للقرار 1325 في فلسطين منسقة الائتلاف الأهلي فبالتالي أنا أفهم تماما طبيعة التآزر والتآزر له علاقة بالخصوصية الفلسطينية لا يمكن في فلسطين أن يتوطن أي قرار أو أن تتوطن أي اتفاقية إلا إذا أخذت بالاعتبار الخصوصية الفلسطينية بأننا دولة تحت الاحتلال ليس لدينا صراع مسلح على خلفية طائفية أو خلفية عرقية أو أي نوع من الصراعات التي نشهدها سواء أو شهدناها في أوروبا الشرقية في الدول العربية وأيضا في آسيا وفي أمريكا اللاتينية وفي إفريقيا الصراع في فلسطين هو صراع بسبب الاحتلال فبالتالي إذا لم يؤخذ بالاعتبار هذه الخصوصية أعتقد أن القرار لن يتوطن بمعنى التوطين أن يدخل ضمن الخطاب أن يدخل ضمن الخطط فبالتالي يعني هذه كان سؤال موجه لي عندما, عندما استلمت الإيميل المحترم الذي جاء من قبلكم بخصوص تقرير الظل نحن فور مصادقة فلسطين على الاتفاقية سيداو خضعنا لتدريبات لها علاقة بالإجراءات التي يجب أن نعملها وكيف عمل لجنة الاتفاقية فشكلنا هذا الائتلاف من كل المؤسسات النسوية وحسب تخصصاتها من أجل رفع تقرير الظل بناء على التقرير الوطني واستلمنا التقارير الوطنية وهناك كان مشاورات بيننا وبين الحكومة على التقرير الوطني وقمنا بتعديلات عديدة عليه بعدها أخذ به وبعدها لم يؤخذ, لم يؤخذ به بسبب طبيعة الدول والحكومات دائما تريد أن تبرر أعمالها تبرر قصوراتها فبالتالي لم تأخذ في كل ملاحظاتنا فبالتالي وضعناها نحن في تقرير, في تقرير الظل 
وتقرير الظل التشاركي بين المؤسسات النسوية هو كان تقرير كاشف وتقرير ناقد للسياسات الحكومية ولتوضيح لتوضيح ما يجري فعلا في المجتمع لأن المجتمع المدني أقرب إلى القاعدة منه إلا من الحكومة إلى القاعدة نحن أقرب لأننا نعمل ضمن منظمات قاعدية جما جماهيرية فبالتالي نفهم وجع النساء نفهم احتياجاتهم ومطالبهم بالتأكيد كان, كان خلاف كبير حول موضوع المساواة حول وظيفة التقرير البعض كان يسميه تقرير تكاملي نحن رفضنا هذا المصطلح لأننا لا نريد أن نكمل على الدولة وكأننا ليس بيننا خلاف بينما نريد أن يكون هذا التقرير ناقد لأن هناك خلاف علينا حول المساواة حول المساواة التامة البعض ينظر إلى المساواة بأنها إنصاف أو عدالة يعني مصطلحات ليس لها أدوات قياس بينما نحن كنا نريد أن نستخدم مصطلح مساواة لأنه له أدوات قياس فبالتالي عندنا إشكالية نحن لأننا السلطة الوطنية الفلسطينية عمرها الآن 27 سنة فبالتالي كانت التشريعات ولا زالت التشريعات والقوانين السارية في فلسطين ليست قوانين فلسطينية إنما هي فلس... قوانين من الأردن قوانين أردنية باعتبار الضفة الغربية كانت خاضعة لل... للنظام الأردني فالقوانين السارية هي قوانين أردنية أما القوانين السارية في غزة فهي القوانين المصرية باعتبار أن غزة قبل الاحتلال كانت خاضعة لمصر فهي قوانين غير فلسطينية وبالتالي متقادمة لا تراعي التطور سواء في المجتمع الفلسطيني أو التطور العام بشكل عام في, الـ في, الـ في العالم التطور العالمي غير مراعى ولا مستوى تطور المرأة الفلسطينية ولا دورها أدوارها المتعددة في المجتمع ولا يراعي بأنها أيضا من الشرائح والقطاعات المناضلة فبالتالي كان في يعني تقريرنا كان تقرير ناقد وكان مهم جدا هذا لأن استطعنا عبر تقريرنا وعبر اللقاءات التي عقدت في جنيف عند تقديم التقرير الأول أن نوضح أكثر للجنة الاتفاقية ما يجري في فلسطين أوجه قصور الحكومة ترددها تلكؤها في وضع سياسات لتقول ماذا تريد أن تعمل على صعيد المؤامة من الجدير بالذكر أنه لحد الآن عندنا مشكلة في موضوع المؤامة والتقدم المحرز ما بين 2014 عندما انضمت فلسطين بلا تحفظ على اتفاقية سيدا وحتى الآن في عام 2021 التقدم المحرز جدا بسيط يقتصر على أربع مسائل نحن حددناها وهي مطالب فيها الدولة من خلال لجنة من خلال التوصيات التي قدمتها لجنة الاتفاقية بعد اجتماعات جنيف يعني وهي, وهي كانت عامل مساعد جدا لنا التوصيات التي قدمت لنستطيع أن نعمل أجندة وخطة بناء على هذه التوصيات 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 كانت عديدة منها أنهم يطالبوا بنشر الاتفاقية منهم منها ما, يريد ما يطالبوا بأن تشرك دولة فلسطين النساء في مراكز صنع القرار بواقع 30% منها أيضا أن يصدر قانون حماية الأسرة من العنف وهو يعني قانون منذ عام 2005 ونحن نتابعه ولحد الآن لم يتم إقراره رغم أننا عملنا تسع مسودات ناقشنا تسع مسودات لحد الآن لم ترى أي مسود النور بسبب الخلافات المجتمعية حول موقع المرأة في المجتمع حول حقوقها لدينا اتجاهات أصولية عقائدية لا تريد أن يكون هناك قانون حماية للأسرة لأنهم يعتبروا أن هذا تدخل في الأسرة وهو, وهو يفكك الأسرة وخضعنا منذ عامين إلى 
هجمة سلفية كبيرة متطرفة على سيداو وطالبوا بإسقاطها طالبوا بإغلاق مقرات المؤسسات النسوية نحن نعيش تحت تأثير هذه الهجمة لحد الآن وللأسف أن الحكومة الفلسطينية تأثرت بهذه الهجمة وبالتالي لم لم تصدر القوانين التي كنا نعالجها لم يصدر قرار الخاص بمشاركة النساء لم يصدر قانون العقوبات الذي كنا أيضا نناقشه وأيضا في استعصاء لقانون الأحوال الشخصية طالبوا بنشر الاتفاقية والحد الآن لم لم يعني لم تقر لم تنشر الاتفاقية في الجريدة الرسمية حسب القوانين وكثير من التوصيات أيضا لم تقر الإنجاز الوحيد أن دولة فلسطين انضمت إلى البروتوكول الاختياري لسيداو وهذا جيد واستقبلناه بالترحاب ولكن كلنا بالتحليل لا نعتقد بأن أي امرأة في فلسطين ستتوجه إلى لجنة الاتفاقية للتشكل فردي ما زالت هي لم تستمتع باتفاقية سيداو الأم ولم تطبق هذه الاتفاقية أيضا وضعت حد أدنى لسن الزواج الدولة وحددته ب 18 سنة وكان هذا جيد ولكن أيضا عملت استثناءات فتحت باب الاستثناءات من سن الزواج فبالتالي وبرصد المؤسسات النسوية لحالات الزواج الاستثنائي وجدناها أنها واسعة وبدون مبررات وجيهة أو مقنعة أيضا جمدت بعض البنود في قانون العقوبات المتقادم المختصة بالقتل على خلفية الشرف والعذر المحل لقتلة النساء على خلفية الشرف ولكن للأسف أبقت بعد البنود التي المتعلقة في هذا مما يفتح الباب لعدم الاستفادة من التعليق الذي عملت فبالتالي إحنا عندنا إشكالية وبعتقد بعد هذه السنوات وبعد أنها أنزارت لجنة الاتفاقية فلسطين وحضرت اجتماع وعملت اجتماعات مع الوزارات المختلفة وأيضا مع المجتمع المدني وتعهدت الدولة بأن تطبق التوصيات وأن تستجيب للتوصيات ولكن لحد الآن لم يطبق مما يجعلني أوصي لجنة الاتفاقية بأن إما تأتي إلى المناطق المحتلة للمراجعة والمراقبة عن لماذا لم لم يتم الاستجابة للتوصيات أو أن تطلب تقرير هو صحيح الدولة عملت تقرير متابعة ونحن بدورنا عملنا تقرير متابعة للمتابعة يعني تقرير ظل لتقرير الدولة ولكن أعتقد أن هناك مطلوب تدخل آخر يتمثل بأن يكون هناك في أسئلة حول عدم التطبيق وما هي خطة دولة فلسطين في مواجهة هذه الهجمة الهجمة على الاتفاقية التي شيطنت الاتفاقية وشيطنت أيضا المؤسسات النسوية اللي عاملة عليها فالتجربة عندنا كانت تجربة تعلمية مهمة جدا جدا ولكن أعتقد أنها وصلت الآن إلى مأزق إلى مأزق أما إذا كنا نتحدث عن القرار 1325 إذا كان السؤال أو لدي من الوقت لأستطرد فممكن أن نقول بأنه أيضا القرار نعم القرار يعاني من نواقص القرار ليس به أجندة زمنية وكأنه قرار مؤبد القرار أيضا لا يوجد له إجراءات للمتابعة وبالتالي إذا كنت بدي أقترح اقتراح في هذه العجلة فأنا أقترح بأنه يعني لابد للقرار مثله مثل الاتفاقيات أن يكون هناك لجنة له لجنة للقرار أو أن أن يكون متابع من قبل لجنة السيداو رغم أنه في هناك يتابع بنيويورك القرار بينما الاتفاقية في 
في جنيف ولكن عندنا مشكلة بأننا نعتبر بأن هذا القرار لا ينطبق إلا بقرار إلا بانطباق القرارات السياسية المتعلقة بفلسطين الصادرة عن مجلس الأمن ونعتبر بأن القرار لا يضمن المساواة هو يتحدث عن مشاركة المرأة في صنع السلام ولكن عملية التآزر جعلتنا نستفيد بأن المساواة مضمونة وجوهر اتفاقية سيداو مما يتطلب التعاون والتآزر بين الاتفاقية لأن الاتفاقية لم يرى المساواة ولم يرى أيضا معالجات لقضية الحماية ولم ولم يتطرق عندما يصطدم بعقبات القرار ماذا علينا أن نفعل وشكرا Thank you so much, Rima. That was a very rich intervention and you touched on, on a number of points. Uh, first and foremost, highlighting that critical importance of civil society, uh, indeed of, of having civil society um, produce the reports, complementing, but, but um, not complementing, like you said, it's not, it's not an additional or supplementary report, but the report in its own right, uh, providing information that uh, uh, perhaps this is not sufficiently highlighted uh, to um, in, in the government uh, report, as well as uh, the the points you made about uh, the the wide range of women's rights, right, that need to be highlighted uh, in CEDA reports, uh, including the 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 early and child marriage that you referred to, and the relevance of that uh, to peace and security, the the application of that. Uh, in the regions that are affected by uh, by conflict or by occupation, such as Palestine, and and Bandana spoke about that before. That the CEDAW committee has highlighted many times that CEDAW applies in in all uh, such contexts. So thank you so much for highlighting this. And your your last call or your last recommendation on really having. Um, uh, sustained diligent follow-up right and and mechanism for monitoring women peace and security uh, and right now the the CEDAW committee and this reporting process is the most robust the more most uh, um, the strongest mechanism that we can imagine for for that purpose of monitoring of reporting on a women peace and security which is why strengthening those those synergies is so critically uh, important I uh, want to open the floor for questions now. We already have a few questions um, that have come in. So I will read them out. And as our panelists uh, answer this first round of questions, I will invite everyone to, to please post your questions uh, in the chat or in the question and answer uh, section. <clears throat> So we have two questions that I believe uh, Bandana were posted uh, during your um, presentation and perhaps most relevant uh, to you. But if Rima and Ella have something to add, of course, also open to them. The first one is uh, specifically regarding the task force on uh, GR30, uh, if there was any particular reason uh, for why it's no longer a task force, but, but rather just a focal uh, point. Uh, and, and how is that consistent with the rhetoric? of support to women. And the second question, which I think all of the participants can address is thinking about health and conflict and, and uh, you know, the impact of conflict on access to, to healthcare, especially sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, the, the, the importance of, of this issue to the women peace and security uh, agenda. Um, how can CEDAW help bridge the gap between uh, you know, the fact that there, there isn't really explicit mentions of SRHR, of sexual and reproductive health and rights in the women's peace and security resolutions, even though it is so critical to them because of the centrality of the sexual violence and conflict to those resolutions. So how can CEDAW contribute to, to bridge this gap between reproductive rights and the women's peace and security agenda? And finally, one more from the chat box, um, the third question on women's participation and how best to include the women participation through this lens of women peace and security in the CEDAW report, uh, not only looking at women's participation, for example, in peace negotiations, but in all aspects of public life, education, work, 
uh, etc. But with the peace or conflict uh, lens. So with those uh, three questions, I'll first turn to you, Bandana, since there was a specific question to you to answer this and any other questions you'd like to to comment on. Thank you, thank you, Agnes. Care about the task force. Now, there's a when you have a task force within the CEDAW committee, it means it's a full-fledged task force backed up by secretariat support will have a mandatorily some meetings during the sessions. It will be reported, it will be documented, it will be included in the report. So having a task force requires human resources, but also it's work. Now, uh, there's a whole lot of budget crunch within the, you know, the treaty bodies are so poorly resourced. The, you know, and more and more, as I am seeing, it's depleting. Uh, you know, we have less human resources. There's hardly one or two people in the secretariat. So it was suggested, and you could have only a certain number of task forces. So since we already had a task force on WPS for, the, for quite a significant time, uh, and there were other emerging issues, uh, and uh, since we did not have secretary, we could not, the secretariat was not in a position to provide support for more task forces. It was suggested, not just WPS, there were others also, it was suggested that we would uh, convert that into a focal point, which means that if anything arises without any secretariat support, uh, the person who is the focal point may call a meeting, but it's not mandatorily, you know, it, it's not routine, it's not consistent. So that's why it's very uh, ad hoc, you know. So it's basically because of uh, human resources constraints. Uh, that we do not have a task force, but we have a focal point now. That's why I was saying, and I was uh, glad to see Mavic's message in the chat since, saying that JNW can, he can perhaps um, support the secretariat uh, to have an intern or an assistant to follow up on the WPS agenda, which would help the work of the um, uh, focal point uh, person a lot, you know, and, and uh, strengthen um, our deliberations, our dialogues, our recommendations to state parties. So that's one thing about the task force. The other about um, uh, the sexual and reproductive health rights and the WPS agenda, how CEDAW can address it, or also the participation issue. I already highlighted that actually we do want the WPS agenda is a cross-cutting agenda that, that, uh, that is applicable throughout the 16 articles. However, time is of constraint. And as I said, as a practice, we try to open the WPS context right at the beginning of the dialogue and include what needs to be included. We have, we have restricted time. A committee member can only pose questions up to five minutes, not more than five minutes. So there are numerous priorities and there are if you study the assess the shadow reports, we do look at the importance, you know. So if I, I, uh, I would like to stress here that if the civil society have submitted shadow reports with the context of participation, sexual and reproductive health rights, linking it to the WPS agenda with evidence, you know, and very specific and clear, the CEDAW committee will prioritize that and address it within the health agenda, within the participation agenda. But uh, if the CEDAW, if, if we do not receive any concerns from civil society, since we have so many numerous priorities, it may not fall on the priority of the questions considering the limited time we have. So I, I, I still say in order to strengthen uh, WPS um, um, agenda through the CEDAW GR30 mechanism, we do rely a lot on the C civil society shadow reports and how they uh, present their, submit their shadow reports based on evidence. It is that basis that gives us the uh, authority to raise those questions with the state parties. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Bandana, and especially this last point on the, again, highlighting the importance of the uh, civil society shadow reports and, and how that, uh, that's a, an excellent way of putting it when you said it gives the, the authority, the mandate to the CEDAW committee members to ask those questions in that limited time and, and to prioritize those questions because you know they're a priority in that particular national or local context. So with this in mind, uh, Ella and, and, and Rima, both as representatives of civil society, do you have any thoughts either on 
on the, the links between women, peace and security and the sexual and reproductive health and rights or the women's participation in different sectors? How have you included this in your shadow reports or how, how do you think it can be included uh, better? Um, whoever would like to take the floor first. <laughs> Rima, do you speak? Rima, would you like to go first? Okay. Go ahead, Rima. نعم يعني ذكرنا إحنا أخذنا بعض المسائل في تقرير الظل اللي هي حسب الأولوية مهمة للمجتمع الفلسطيني ومنها الموضوع الصحي حيث طبعاً عنا إحنا نقص موارد. في في دولة فلسطين بسبب بسبب الحالة الخاصة وهي الاحتلال ولكن أيضا هناك قصور من قبل السلطة في تخصيص موازنات للنهوض بالوضع الصحي في في البلاد فبالتالي عنا في شح في المستشفيات عنا شح بعدد الأسرة عنا إشكالية في في الصحة الإنجابية للنساء وفي معالجتها تقوم مؤسسات المجتمع المدني ذات العلاقة بالصحة في تغطية هذا الموضوع وهنا أريد أن أنوه على مسألة يعني مسألة مهمة أنه بالفترة الأخيرة قامت قام الاحتلال بإغلاق ست مؤسسات صحية مؤسسات من المؤسسات المجتمع المدني منها مؤسسة صحية تقدم تقدم خدمات في الصحة الإنجابية فبالتالي الوضع الصحي في فلسطين متراجع بسبب طبعا سوء الموارد ونقص الموارد وأيضا زاد الطين بل الكوفيد خلال الكوفيد تراجع الوضع الصحي أصبحت الولادات تكون في المنازل وإذا قارنا بين الضفة وبين قطاع غزة نجد أن هناك تطور أوسع في الضفة عنه في غزة بسبب الحروب المتوالية على غزة دائما المستشفيات مليئة بالجرحى على حساب النساء وإذا جاءت النساء ولدينا توثيقات إذا جاءتنا نساء جاءت نساء للولادة هي تمضي فقط ساعة في المستشفى ومن ثم ثم تعاد إلى بيتها بالإضافة إلى إشكالات وتفاصيل كتير مضنية عنا أيضا كمان بسبب سوء الأوضاع وبسبب الحواجز لدينا ولادات على الحواجز منهم من توفين أو توفيت مواليدهم أيضا بسبب سوء الحال وهذا جميعه لدينا توثيقات توثيقات حوله وإن شاء الله إذا التقرير القادم ممكن أنه نخصصه له لهذا إحنا واقعين بين, بين عنفين بين مشكلتين مشكلة أننا تحت الاحتلال من جانب يمارس علينا العنف وسوء ويصادر الموارد ويصادر الأراضي ويبني المستوطنات بالقرب من القرى الفلسطينية وأيضا لدينا الذكورة والأبوية جدا والعادات والتقاليد المتأصلة الرجعية أيضا تحجم دور النساء وتضطهدهم فبالتالي إحنا بين, بين إشكالين العنف في فلسطين عنف مركب ومعقد لأنه احتلال طويل الأمد وأيضا لدينا اتجاهات فكرية تحجم من واقع النساء وتعمل على إقصائهم عن مواقع صنع القرار فبالتالي المشكلة مشكلة مزدوجة Thank you so much, Rima, and, and for highlighting that uh, those issues mentioned in the chat, indeed, the participation and the sexual and reproductive health and rights in particular are, are related to conflict situations, to, to checkpoints, to closure of, of health centers uh, in the context of occupation, but sometimes also distraction in the context of conflict. So, so these additional, let's say, aspects or factors need to be really highlighted in the CEDAW reports, uh, both by the state parties and by by the civil society. Um, Ella, would you like to add anything on either of those questions? <laughs> yes, I want to say about how we can invite uh, uh, current, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, 
uh, how we invite different NGOs or different target group, women's target group and our coalition to prepare a, CEDO, a shadow report to CEDO committee. Mm -hmm. The first, now we share information to different NGOs, not only women's NGOs, or not only women's group, to different women, uh, groups and to different NGOs. We will start write a shadow report. We will invite you and our rules, our uh, how we will work, and our rules how we will work. If we have money for uh, to write a shadow report or no, and how we will work. And the second. We organize a training for them. As I mentioned in my speech, it's important for us to have knowledge. What's this? What's this process? And what's the CEDO, CEDO committee, how it's working? What's this uh, women's peace and security agenda? And uh, third point, what is important? We uh, collect different information from different organizations and from different uh, uh, regions. Just example, sometimes we can call to some NGOs in the rural area and ask them, please help us to receive information. Actually, if we are talking about Ukraine and data is important for us, and it's very difficult to receive data in from rural area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually, it's second point and uh, very important for us to have information about sexual violence in Ukraine, especially Donbass region, especially Crimea region, but uh, it's difficult, very difficult in Ukraine. Many NGOs and many experts don't want to speak about it. And uh, we uh, write them official letter about confidential information. We uh, write them, we can uh, meet with you. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes it's uh, help. Sometimes we ask different groups who can, uh, who can have contact with them. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's works. Thank you so much, Ella, and uh, for highlighting this importance to have the diverse issues represented. We really need to have diverse um, actors, uh, diverse uh, organizations involved in the process of drafting of a shadow report and in the implementation of both Women, Peace and Security and CEDA. So I just wanted to share as well and, and highlight that the Democracy uh, Development Center uh, is actually an initiator of a civil society uh, network or, or working group on 1325, which, which is a diverse uh, network of organizations working on implementing 1325, but also monitoring, getting this information that Ella was talking about, and, and it's also feeding into the, the shadow report uh, process. Um, I would like, sorry, mm -hmm. I would like to add a success story about how we started work with widows in mm -hmm. Ukraine. And they didn't support us. They didn't believe us and ask, why are you right? Uh, we don't work with you and we don't know you, etc., etc. et cetera. We, yes, uh, we represented them our job. After that, we invited that our, for our trainings. And after that, we uh, uh, asked them, uh, what do you think? Maybe you should create your angels. You can represent your group. And we supported them. We uh, uh, gave them knowledge about what is NGO, how NGOs work it. And after that, they registered and helped us to write shadow report. Sorry. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, and this, this question of widows, I'm glad that you're mentioning it. This is an important point to, 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 to highlight as well. Uh, widows have a key, as a key constituency and the young widows as well, which is something we've observed in our work in, in Ukraine, especially in the context of conflict. Unfortunately, young women uh, lose their spouses, use their, uh, lose their husbands, and of course face both the psychological and emotional trauma, but also the economic and, 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 and social ramifications of that status. We have almost arrived at the end of our, of our event today. So I want to uh, thank you all for, 
for joining us, for, for being with us for, uh, for, this, uh, for this discussion. Uh, we hope from our side as the Global Network of Women Peace Builders to continue this discussion. We hope that this is not the last time that we are convening this, uh, these three wonderful speakers and many more that have worked on it. Uh, to conclude our uh, discussion, I would like to perhaps just give one minute and uh, I will uh, time you because we are on a, on a, on a tight, uh, schedule just one minute to uh, each of the uh, speakers to maybe share one most important on or one recommendation you would like to bring to the attention so one minute for one recommendation and uh, to uh, and I will start with with uh, uh, bandana bandana the floor is yours thank you I would just like to say that gr30 is the only and powerful mechanism that can strengthen state accountability. I mean, uh, it may not work all the time, but it is the only mechanism. So we have to engage with it and uh, uh, provide specific uh, reports, shadow reports, alternative reports. It, it, may, it need not be lengthy, but it has to be short and specific to the CEDAW committee if you have particular concerns of the particular country that is reporting to CEDAW. And uh, I assure you that it will be taken up in the dialogue, uh, but uh, just having it in the dialogue does not mean it will be implemented like Rima did share a lot of concerns. However, it will give you a tool to strengthen your advocacy with the government if the CEDAW makes the recommendations to please engage with the GR30 mechanism. Thank you so much. A clear recommendation, engage with the GR30 mechanism and with the concluding observations, use the concluding observations. The engagement does not end with the submission of the civil society report. The concluding observations are a key advocacy tool for the following four years until the next report is, is prepared. Uh, Ella, now one minute for you for your one key recommendation. Uh, yes, it's my recommendation about please contact with different organizations, especially international organizations. They can help you understand what this process and how you can write the report, report especially UN Women Office uh, in your country or regional office. Uh, especially, please contact with CEDAW uh, committee members. They're very open and they can help you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. Also an excellent uh, recommendation. And reach out to Ella, to Rima, to others who have done this successfully in other countries. Uh, let's create this global synergy, this, this global network uh, for this. And of course, uh, please feel free to follow us, the GNWP as well. My colleague, Wevin, posted our, our handle, our social media handle online and don't hesitate to reach out. We are, we are always we are all keen to, to, to support this work. Rima, over to you for your, your final word, your final recommendation. One minute. نعم لدي توصية بأن وهي توصية الفلسطينية ككل ليس توصية فردية بأن يكون هناك قرار لاحق للقرار 1325 يتحدث عن النساء تحت الاحتلال القرار لا يذكر لا يذكر ذلك التوصية 30 ذكرت ولكن التوصية نعرف بأنها ليست بقوة القرار القرار لحقه تسع, تسع قرارات لاحقة أخذت بالاعتبار التطورات على حالات النزاع والصراع وتحديدا في العالم العربي ولكن لم تأخذ بالاعتبار آخر وأطول احتلال في العالم وهو احتلال فلسطين فبالتالي لا بد من ذكر لأنه عندنا بفلسطين النساء لا يريدوا أحيانا التعامل رغم الإنجازات الكبيرة التي حققناها بالنزول إلى القاعدة وتوعية القاعدة وبأن القرار يعني يوفر لنا آلية للاشتباك مع الاحتلال والاشتباك مع الخلافات والسلم الأهلي لأنه لدينا أيضا إحنا خلافات وصلت يعني وصلت إلى حدود أيضا اشتباكات مسلحة وفر إلنا 1325 هذه المنصة لمعالجة الخلافات الداخلية وقد نجحنا مؤخرا بجمع الفئات الحزبية المتناحرة ما بين بعضها البعض بعد ست سنوات من الصعوبات التي واجهتنا نحن النساء كنا قادرات على جمع هذه الفئات لنتوصل معهم إلى اتفاق نسوي وليس اتفاق سياسي 
اتفاق نسوي حول القضايا المختلف عليها فبالتالي هناك تشكيك بأن القرار هذا لا ينطبق في قرار أبدي مثله مثل القرارات السابقة لذلك نريد قرار واضح يشمل النساء تحت الاحتلال وأيضا أنا راغبة بأن لجنة الاتفاقية تزور فلسطين مرة أخرى Shukran, thank you so much, Rima. So, a uh, call for attention to the, uh, to the, of course, uh, the situation of women in Palestine, but also a call to bring the resolution to the local uh, populations, to the local areas, to conflict affected populations. And I think that's an extremely a strong accent, extremely strong point to end on. The localization of women, peace and security is also one of the key tools to make sure that it is implemented and that then it is monitored effectively where it matters most at the local level. So with that, I would like to thank you all. Thank um, Bandana, Ella and Rima for sharing your insights, your perspectives, your uh, expertise with us today. Thank you all for being online and, and listening and asking insightful questions and uh, wish us all a good continuation of this uh, work and many, many fruitful discussions uh, to come. Thank you again. And uh, this uh, event is now closed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shikran. Thank you.